And this is 88.5 FM WVOF in Fairfield, Connecticut. Joe Kelly here with another edition of The Upper Room. Our next guest is a multi-talented instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer, and uh, she was a guest of ours. And, and I'm ashamed to say a few years back because uh, this was about seven years ago that Jenny Laws visited our show to uh, talk about her album, Introducing Jenny Law. Since then, there's been so much stuff she's been involved with, her own music and uh, writing and producing for other artists. And currently, she has a great new single, and we're here to talk about that and everything else. Jenny Laws, welcome back. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Joe. Um, the new single just got released officially, and uh, it's available on iTunes and a bunch of other places, right? Yeah, all the digital outlets that I can think of. <laughs> That's right. It's called Sabotage and, and Multi-Mix is on it. We're going to listen to to one of them uh, in just a bit. Tell us about the new sound on this single and, um, you know, what what brought you to, to this kind of feel. Yeah, well, usually, you know, for my own music, for my own album and project, I often will write the song with an instrument or write, just in the air where I hear the melody and the lyrics in my head and I sing it out loud and then I write the chords to that and then it gets produced around that or I'll be collaborating, you know, in real time with the producer and we'll vibe together and write the song together. But not too often for my own project do I write to an already existing track, right? That's more when I write for other people for, you know, R&B and hip-hop and stuff. Where my own music is more song-based and then we produce around it. Um, I tend to like that because it ends up being where you have more freedom with the writing and the chords and everything, right? Because I really like to take it places with the chords and go different places. So th this is kind of uncommon for me to do this, but I met this producer's manager, and he said, we're looking for artists to write with and stuff and singers to demo songs and stuff. Can we can we connect? And I was like, sure, for sure. You know, send me some stuff, whatever. First beat he sent was the beat that you hear now that is on, you know, for sabotage. And I said, oh my God, you have to save this beat for me, please. I, I just give me a couple weeks. I'm just I'm swamped for the next couple weeks, but please save it for me, right? And I meant to write, to just to write over. It didn't have to be for my project, but just for me to have the claim over the beat to write over. And so I pretty much immediately I had been through a situation, <laughs> as you can tell once you hear the song, and I pretty much immediately, you know, wrote the whole song and did a quick demo, just a rough idea, and sent it over, and they loved it, and, they were, and the producer suggested, well, why don't you use this for your album? And I would never suggest that, because I didn't want to, like, steal his beat that he had, you know, I thought maybe wanted to sell to someone or pitch to a big artist or whatever, but it was his idea, and I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. I mean, it's, I said it's different from my other stuff, because it's more hip-hop based. I mean, I do, I'm definitely influenced by hip-hop. And you can hear it in a lot of the beats, but not as much in the musical production around it. Usually I'll have like a hip-hop beat, but then really soulful retro production. Right. Whereas this is like really modern, and I was like, it's going to be different. But, you know, some of my other songs on my album, I would like to produce this way, because he's actually helping me on a couple other songs on my album. Okay. I'm like, I think, it'll, I think it'll fit. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of how it all came about. And then, and then this rapper from L.A., well, I stayed in touch with him, one of the people I met out there when I was living there. He, you know, emailed me back to one of my newsletters, I think, and he said, you better save 16 bars for me. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this is the only song I can really hear him on because of, you know, the nature of it. It's so hip-hop feel, at least. And so I sent it over to him, and the rest is history. You know, Bob Horn, the mix engineer, he decided to do his own mix to it. He said, oh, I think that we should, you know, compress this part and make it just happen faster, take out the ad lib." So that's how the the radio mix came about and that's the actual official version that got released so there was sort of three incarnations of the song before it is what it is today uh, you can go to Jenny's website Jenny Laws is our guest her website JennyLaws.com J-E-N-N-I-E L-A-W-S dot com and uh, great new uh, single featuring Scipio on it as well and, that's right uh, since introducing uh, Jenny Laws, a, a lot has been going on uh, musically. You uh, have released some some music, and you, you're out in L.A. before, and now back in uh, hometown of Toronto. So let's let's talk about the uh, the the L.A. scene when you went out there and working on music uh, in the City of Angels. Ha! 
Yep. Or is it <laughs> the City of Angels? angels out there for sure. <laughs> There's a lot of really creative, talented people out there. It was, it was great. I mean, after the release of the EP, which you, you had me on your show about a while ago. Right. Um, there were, we had a couple years of you know a lot of requests to do shows, some big events, some celebrity events, uh, you know showcases in LA, uh, sponsored events. So it, there was a good run for a couple years after that, and then it kind of died down. I, I, we didn't really know how to keep the momentum going. We weren't able to get a tour going. Unfortunately, we really wanted to make that happen. We tried, and you know how it is. It's, right. it's, it costs a lot of money, and everything kind of has to align for that to happen. And especially being Canadian, it was that was sort of a bit of a of a, uh, I don't want to say like a, I don't say boundary, mm-hmm. a little bit of a, it was a bit of a struggle to tour in the states as a Canadian. I guess what I'm saying. There's right. a lot of red tape, right. um, but we did our best. We did a lot with it, and and so after that, I focused on the next project and also learning to become a songwriter. I mean, I thought, oh, I want to do it. Let's, you know, I want to write for other artists. And I didn't realize it's a, it's a learning curve, you know, writing for other artists is a whole other thing. So I was basically just getting a lot of experience collaborating with a lot of different producers and songwriters. And a lot of it ended up being for my album. So I basically laid the groundwork for the project that is now almost done and about to be released. That was mostly what I focused on, but I did some songwriting for other people. Nothing that's necessarily been hugely landed yet. Some, you know, um, Canadian talent, some songs that I landed on their projects, um, but still working on actually getting placements with bigger artists. Um, but there's exciting things brewing on that area. I don't really want to announce it yet because until it happens, you know, you don't, you, you can't be sure, right? right? But yeah, I've definitely been working on uh, writing for other artists, and the LA experience was a huge part of me learning how to really do that properly because it's a, it's a whole other thing when you're writing for other artists, especially in today's climate when. There's a lot of um, play on words that is happening now in songs where you have to be <clears throat> super clever. You can't just write a song from your heart and tell your story. You have to have some clever twist on it. You have to have some play on words, something that's never been said before in that way, you know? So you, you have to be super creative and innovative and cutting edge and forward thinking. And that's a different way of approaching things than when you're just coming from your heart as an artist and writing about your own experiences and being, you know, more authentic. Um, I want to always keep it authentic, even as a songwriter, but then also step it up a notch and be even more clever about it. So it took a while to learn how to do that. I'm still learning. (laughs) Um, But I find that my classic songwriting, in the sense that I bring the timeless melodies and I bring chord progressions that are also timeless and classic and uh, catchy, the melodies are also memorable. I'm able to bring that to the table, and I think that a lot of people see that as a big value. So, yeah, I was super busy out there, and I learned so much and planted a lot of seeds, so I'm looking forward to seeing them sprout in the near future, hopefully. That's right, and the, the one that is sprouting right now is the new single from Jenny Law's Sabotage featuring Scipio on it. We're going to give a listen to it right now. And uh, you can go to iTunes, and buy it, and also uh, all the other electronic sites. JennyLaws.com, she's got a really up-to-date site, and she stays involved with social media as well. So we'll come back and talk once again with Jenny one from Jenny Laws, Sabotage, featuring Scipio on there. Her website, of course, is JennyLaws.com, and uh, you can listen to uh, a wide uh, array of her music. Also, uh, some great videos, and keep up to date on upcoming shows as well. You're back in Toronto, and uh, we were talking about the Toronto music scene off air. Uh, what what's it like up there? Uh, first of all, when you first got into music, and with with the scene up there, and what what has uh, changed now, and what can be improved? Mm. <laughs> it has definitely changed a lot. A lot has happened in the past ten years since I started when I was a teenager, and. At first, there was a lot more, uh, I'd say, showcase opportunities, like more local open mics and things where industry people would come and check you out. I think now those situations, I think producers still go out to them, but I think now the industry is more checking online. They're more checking YouTube now for YouTube stars. So that's the difference where the live music scene isn't where A&Rs are finding talent anymore, it seems. 
unless it's like some designated showcase where they're invited because someone paid them to be part of this showcase that the artists are paying to be a part of type thing, you know. But just to go out to live music to find talent, it, it, I don't think that's happening that much anymore. Uh, still a great live music scene, though, in Toronto. Still a ton of talent. Um, the urban music scene is growing. Mm -hmm. It still has a lot of room for improvement. Uh, it's still kind of very elite. Um, only certain people are getting shine and love. Um, I have to say, it's sort of tough being, as they say, blue-eyed soul. Right. As opposed to um, of a, a certain ethnicity, of any ethnicity other than white. Um, you'd think that it would be an advantage. Um, I'm not complaining, but <laughs> um, it's just, you know, tough navigating the waters a bit when, you know, I can't help that I'm soulful. I've always been my entire life. It's not something I'm trying to do. It's just what I am. Right. So the soul and R&B music scene isn't very big still. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, I'm still kind of keeping my mind international on that, reaching out to the UK, the States, like Connecticut. Right, that's right. <laughs> and, you know, because there's just more of a population too. I think still Canada doesn't have the population to support the urban market as much as it needs to be supported, but we're working on it. People, there's tons of people that are committed to improving the urban music scene in Canada and it continues to grow slowly but surely and I hope to be a part of that movement. I mean, I am, but I hope to help even more to help it improve, especially for new young artists coming up to have a platform for them to express themselves and reach music fans. Well, I know with radio, when we're up in Montreal, the, the stations that that we listen to, you know, the the programs that are cool are like at twelve midnight, two in the morning, um, like yeah. a CKUT. It's it's you know independent, I guess, station up there. But um, how, how's the rate? Is it similar up there? The the airplay and is yeah, it, yeah. I think so. Yeah, because um, I've started to read about Clear Channel and stuff. Uh, this book, I, I can find it. It's over here, and it talks about how pretty much Clear Channel owns most of the stations and how a lot of companies have monopolies. So then a lot of the same music is getting played on the mainstream radio stations. Right. So yeah, it's the smaller radio stations and the later shows and the independent stations that are playing the actual new music and new artists or independent artists or different music that's not the stuff you hear every day played 40 times a day. As much as some of that stuff can be great as well. Um, yeah, you don't you don't hear a lot of the underground music unless you yeah you t tune into those special shows. CBC Radio is actually great. Okay. CBC plays a lot of local talent, a lot of unknown artists, um, independent artists, really cool, quirky stuff, creative stuff. You know, really artistic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I really got to give it up to CBC for keeping that going and not giving in to the top 40, the, the same old, same old, as much as, like I said, there's a, there is definitely an art to making a great pop song. Um, but we just, you know, it's good to have both to also have that really artsy stuff to feed your soul every now and then. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you really have to kind of seek out those shows. They're not in your face like the, like the mainstream radio. Well, we're going to get into some more of your music going back a little bit. This is uh, Battle Alone. Tell us about this particular song. Ah, well, uh, this song was a collaboration with a producer, a dance producer named Corey Bold. And um, I I don't know what happened to him. He, I think he went through something, so we had to complete the song on our own. Unfortunately, I wish we could have completed it with him because he would have done an even better job at finishing the production so it was just a beat that he sent and he was all excited about what I wrote and then I think he maybe went through some family stuff and then and just fell off and I really hope he's okay Corey wherever you are I'm sending you love <laughs> and please don't be mad at me for releasing the song without you I I um you know I really tried to get a hold of him to see if it was okay and he just never got back to me and I just thought well you know I don't I want to get this out there so I just put it up on SoundCloud and it was just again it was just something I wrote over a beat that he sent he was just a producer that wanted to collaborate with me and he's so amazing so I was like of course I'm down let's do it and this is the result of that and, and I'm sure he, he loves it so Corey give Jenny a call <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is Jenny Laws, Battle Alone. We'll come back and talk one more time with Jenny Laws. Don't forget her new record is out, Sabotage. But this is Battle Alone right here on The Upper Room with Joe Kelly. 
and WVOF in Fairfield, Connecticut. Discography, she's got great music and uh, she's a great songwriter. It's called Battle Alone, JennyLaws.com. Now, some of the stuff you've been writing for, you actually uh, wrote some some music for uh, Bruno Mars' uh, sisters, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, I I was in a session with a bunch of other writers. There was a ton of us really talented people out at uh, where Colby Calais works out of, uh, Revolver Studios okay. in Thousand Oaks, L.A., and there was just so many people in the room, but I was able to luckily contribute to the pre-choruses. I wrote the pre-choruses of that song. It's this great song called Headed Home. And uh, one of the songwriters ended up recording it himself as well and releasing it on the Craigslist Joe soundtrack. Okay. And then the Lilas recorded, that's the name of Bruno Mars' sister's group, the Lilas. Right. They recorded their version of it and released it as well uh, a couple months later. So that was a cool thing. They have beautiful voices. Uh, I know they have a lot going on with they're all mothers and stuff um but i really hope that they continue doing music because they really have sweet poems and a soulful approach to things yeah uh, also uh we want to uh ask you about you you, you like the old style instruments i uh, i was reading uh some vintage gear and stuff like that yeah i um, i i finally was able to get myself a fender rose 1977 okay it was actually the same road that, um, what was it? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. What's that band? Uh, Three Dog Night. Three Dog Night. Yeah. Apparently it was the same instrument, actual keyboard, that they took on the road with them when oh, they had okay. that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so cool, right? And it just has, it's just, there's nothing like the real thing, real instruments, even if it's not vintage, just a real grand piano. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have arguments sometimes with even some really high-profile musicians that play for, you know, big artists and stuff. They're, I mean, huge, you know, and, and they'll be like, nobody cares, Jenny, nobody <laughs> cares whether it's a real piano or a fake piano. And I was like, I beg to differ. Like, I disagree. Right. I don't agree. I think that maybe they don't know why it feels better, but they'll feel it. It'll feel different. It'll feel more alive, more organic. They'll sense a human element behind it. They'll also sense the frequency difference that a real instrument will offer and the space around it because with a with a MIDI instrument you don't have the room that you're in you don't have that space around it of, of you know the the real instrument and it reverberating in the room or the, the amp or whatever it is um, not to mention the actual real wood the real strings the real mallets hitting the strings whatever you know and I'm just so passionate about real sounds, whether they're new or old, especially old instruments, like old synthesizers, like old Moog. I just recorded an old Moog when I was in New York a few months ago. Right. I was staying with a, a violin player of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, staying, He wasn't there. I was I was sub, like house-sitting for right. him. And, and so he's like, feel free to use my studio. And so he had this old Moog little, little tiny little keyboard and there's just nothing like those old sounds. And you hear, actually, speaking of Bruno Mars, you hear on his records the difference. Like, uh, Mark Ronson and Jeff Basker are always, they're the producers that were largely responsible for most of his, his production. Mm-hmm. And you hear those old synthesizers and old instruments that they use and how it gives it such a classic, timeless sound and, and huge. And it just sounds bigger because I, feel, I really think the frequency range is larger so whether people can tell or not what you know the difference like they whether they can tell you what it is what the difference is i i really believe that they can feel it on some level even if it's subconscious and to me that matters that's important you know so it's, it's a battle that i'm fighting all the time with people but it's a battle worth fighting in my opinion yeah and i, I think on new york they have a uh, moog festival are they used to Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. And I think even once I tweeted about it, and then I think their, their daughter, no, no, what it was, it was B3, sorry. Oh, okay. Like Hammond's, Hammond's organs. Yeah, right. Hammond, oh, yeah. It was Hammond's granddaughter. I tweeted about how excited I was about recording this Hammond organ, and his granddaughter tweeted me back and said, we, we're glad you you love our instruments. I'm like, that's so cool. But yeah, I mean, there's still, those families that created those instruments, they're still around, and they're still carrying on the legacy. And I think they should carry it on forever because, I mean, they changed music as we know it. Yeah, I mean, a B3, that's that's a phenomenal sound, yeah. Nothing like it. Yeah. <laughs> Incomparable. Right. Well, we got we to gotta give props uh, to a, a lady who's stuck by your career to, to this day, uh, Jackie Thompson, a great friend of ours as well. 
Um, how, how did you first become affiliated with Jackie and become friends? That was through Narda Michael Walden. He oh, okay, yeah. The producer from the 80s. And yeah, great drummer, right? Great drummer for Mahavishnu Orchestra and so on and so on. And he, he plays drums for a lot of people, but then he became largely a producer for Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, so on. Especially Whitney and Mariah. He, he was, especially Whitney, uh, sorry, Mariah, right? Most of her early stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, the early stuff, yeah. So he, you know, quote, discovered me, I guess, in Toronto. It was a fluke thing where they needed a female keyboard player for a showcase that he was putting on for an artist that he was producing. And he was playing drums for her as well. And it was a, some kind of press conference or showcase. And they just needed someone to look the part. They needed a cute female. And here I was, I learned the part, you know, I practiced and everything, I show up, and they were like, no, no, we're not even turning on your keyboard, you just need to look cute. I was like, really? <laughs> but I guess he liked my right. enthusiasm and my attitude, and so he he asked, you know, I said, oh, well, I have this new project. Um, it was 14 songs before it got cut down to seven. Jackie actually cut my EP in half. Okay. It was originally a full, full-length album that I had created before I met her. And then she decided, oh, let's, you know, let's just introduce you with an EP. And then she get, literally called it Introducing Jenny Love. She renamed it even. I had called it Tears of a Phoenix. Okay. So she kind of rebranded it. And there, I just trusted her. She's great at that stuff, right? You yeah. know. Um, so she was managing him at the time. And he turned out he loved it. And he freaked out. He thought, he assumed that I would suck, like, I guess, most people that give him music. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like, usually really, really mediocre. And then he was, he's like, whoa, she's actually really good. And so I guess he was playing my stuff. And she was around, and she goes, who is this? And then the rest is history, because, you know, at first it was a conflict of interest when I was working with him, so we couldn't work together at first, so then I had another manager. But then when that fell apart, she stepped in and she said, I don't like what he was doing, like the manager, that is, that I had. Right. She's like, this is what I would do differently, and I was like, please, let's do it. And then we ended up working together for a good five years, and then she ended up going a different direction, because she ended up having a family, and right. just things changed, and... You know, but we still stay in touch and constantly, and uh, she's still somebody that I consult and a uh, huge support to me, and she's the one that connected us, so I yeah, thank her right. for that. I'll always be grateful, and she'll always be part of my team, and I just love her to pieces. Yeah, Jackie. Jackie's real cool. We love her. So um, talk about another uh, gentleman who's just a legend through music from the Motown days to Maxwell to his current stuff. <laughs> With his uh, love music, for lack of a better phrase, but you've worked with Leon Ware, the great Leon Ware. Oh, yeah. I think Leon, love music is a great word for him, or, or you can even say sexy music. Right, right. About, <laughs> or sensual. He likes the word sensual. Yeah, that's, a, that's a right. That's a term, yeah. Yeah, Leon Ware. It's his birthday in a couple of days, so shout out to Leon Ware. Or maybe by the time you hear this it has already passed but I believe his birthday's on Valentine's Day oh okay so happy birthday Leon <laughs> yeah it was Jackie that connected us and he's so inspiring he wrote a lot of Marvin Gaye's material and oh yeah I forgot about the biggest well, Marvin Gaye yeah. Minnie, Minnie Ripperton yeah oh okay yeah well some of the most most memorable famous songs of hers Come to My Garden and things that had the play double entendre, entendre he's all about that mm-hmm. Yeah, it was such an honor to work with him. He he brought some chords to the table and a verse, and then I came up with the chorus and then brought with a producer, and and then I asked Dwele, would he like to to sing with me on this? Dwele is an artist from Detroit okay. yeah. who has done his thing for years in the, in the soul R&B scene. And so now we have a song. Uh, it's almost done. Just have to get it mixed. So I'll send it to you as soon as it's done, and I'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, but yeah, it's called I Need You, a uh, co-wrote a song with Leon Ware, the legendary. Oh yeah, another chapter in his his career, uh, starting with you. I hope so, yeah. and he continues to go over to Japan and to Europe, and as you said, Connecticut sometimes, yeah. to do shows, and definitely if you ever get a chance to see Leon Ware live, I've seen him live. It's such a treat. It's just amazing to see this man. He's over 70, yeah. and he's still full of energy and sensuality. Every Everything he says and does is about that. <laughs> and it's, he's, he's, But it's, he's just this peaceful, loving human being, just like his music. He really is that person. 
it's it's not a pretense he lives that yeah we definitely look forward to to hearing the new sounds but we're digging uh sabotage the current single from jenny laws featuring scipio you got three mixes on it right yeah, because yeah. there was the original version before the rapper got on, and yeah. then there was the version with the rapper before Bob Horn did his radio mix, Okay, and then the radio mix is now the official version because it moves a bit quicker, and, and it's just, there's less, he called it dead air. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I called it just vibing out, you know, a couple a couple bars of just me ad-libbing with the beat just kind of plays, mm-hmm. but he said, oh, you know, he knows a bit about these things and he felt that it needed to move along quicker so he took out the interlude where I was ad-libbing and instead of a pre-chorus that's kind of long and drawn out and just kind of peaceful and vibey he put that underneath the end of the verse so he kind of compressed it kind of like overlapped it right and shortened it he shortened it and then and then kept the rap in there he says that rap vocals are always good for radio he says <laughs> yeah it definitely dominates I mean it's it's you know, we we love hip hop too, so it's good to have the taste. On I love hip hop. Yeah. I listen to a lot of hip hop, so it's right. it's not a stretch for me to start to show that with right. my new music. Some people are, you know, surprised, like, oh, what happened to the acoustic st- sound? You know, it's like, well, you know, people evolve, people change, and I've always been a hip hop head since mm-hmm. high school, really, and it's a huge part of me. So it only makes sense for me to start to show that and express that with my music. Yeah, you got that right out there and great sabotage available go to jennylaws.com the links are up there where you can uh, get it buy it and uh, definitely play it and we're looking forward to all the great new music uh, from Jenny Laws and we're definitely going to touch base when the new music drops you know Leon Ware and, and all the other great stuff you're working on I would love that let's definitely do that so, so let's uh, go back to Introducing Jenny Laws. I got a couple tracks ready that we're going to give our listeners once again. Heavenly, and we're going to seg right into You Choose. Two mm. great, great songs. And uh, you still play those live? Heavenly, I play live all the time. You Choose, not as much, no. Okay. It didn't end up uh, translating live unless with a band. And oh. I don't get to play with a full band that much. Oh, okay. That's I got you. Yeah. Why. When I was playing with a band, I would all the time. I did for years. And then just recently, I've just been doing more acoustic shows okay. because it's just more affordable. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> more compact. <Yep. laughs> and uh, it, it doesn't translate to acoustic as well. So. Okay. We'll maybe listen in. Well, maybe I'll try and bring it back in for you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to put pressure <laughs> on you, but <laughs> that's all right. So uh, this is uh, Jenny Laws, uh, Heavenly, and you choose. And and thanks, Jenny, for coming by once again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Joe. Okay. This is Jenny Laws.